Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, the Let's Fix UK Whistleblowing Law launch by Protect, the national whistleblowing charity. Welcome to Garden Court, albeit virtually. Uh, you're all most welcome. I can see that we have uh, over 80 participants. You are all very welcome. I'm Mukti R. Singh. I'm a barrister here at Garden Court. I practice in employment law and commercial and business ethics. I've been a supporter of Protect, as it is now known, for some time. I'm a member of their legal support network, and uh, I try as much as I can to assist them with cases of interest and reform, including some assistance with the whistleblowing bill. Uh, before we start today, some housekeeping. Uh, you've noted that we are being recorded. Uh, this recording may be circulated, uh, including on websites and social media. So by uh, continuing, you are uh, confirming your consent for the same to be done. Um, unless you're a panelist, you've been placed on mute. Um, but there will be opportunities for you to ask questions, and we ask that you use the question and answer uh, function on Zoom, not the chat facility. You can use the chat facility if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. If, of course, you fall out due to connection, if it, uh, connection issues, you can uh, follow the link straight back in. Today's webinar is to launch Protect's campaign to reform whistleblowing law. Protect have drafted their own whistleblowing bill, setting out how we could reform the Public Interest Disclosure Act and bring it up to date. Now, this event is timely because we anticipate an employment bill being in the Queen's speech on May the 11th, and that may well be a vehicle for reform. Protect will also be encouraging back back bench MPs to consider their draft bill if they are successful in the private members bill ballot. In the last session there were two private members bills attempting to reform whistleblowing law and so there is a clamour for uh, reform. Whether we whistleblow and how we respond to whistleblow um, I think tells us a lot about who we are and the importance we place on legal obligations. Consider the following scenario. Imagine that you are at an in-person event. You're at our wonderful chambers in Lincoln's Inn Fields in Garden Court. And one of you makes an allegation that you thought that I was stealing from one of the attendees during a coffee break. Uh, and let's say protect and Garden Court respond in what I would call the right way. You're supported. You're protected from detriment. The matter is properly investigated. This is a win-win scenario. The individual whistleblower is supported. Further whistleblowing is encouraged. The organisation is able to weed out any possible theft and prevent further theft. And there's a wider public benefit in the rights of speech, free speech are underscored and the legal obligation not to steal is strengthened. What if there was a different approach? The allegation is ignored or covered up. The organisations become defensive, looking for wrongdoing on your part. Negative comments are circulated about you. You're dismissed. If the matter litigates, technical arguments are adopted. You don't have a right to bring a claim against Protect or Garden Court as you're not workers. You only made an allegation. You didn't disclose any information. You did not believe you were acting in the public interest. You were trying to disguise your own wrongdoing and you were dismissed because of your wrongdoing. Litigation is aggressive, knowing that you're unlikely to have the funds to go all the way to trial. And if you do, there will be appeals. Now, I hope that whistleblowing reform will make it much more difficult for employers to take this approach because unfortunately, far too often, that is the type of approach that I see as a practitioner. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be joined on the panel today by Dame Margaret Hodge MP, Kevin Hollingrick MP and Dr Chris Day, 
alongside Protect CEO Liz Gardiner. Each speaker today will speak for around five to 10 min minutes on an important aspect of Protect's campaign. There will be time for questions and answers at the end, and we encourage you again to use the question and answer function. Uh, you can post questions as we go along. I start first with Liz Gardner, the, one of the driving forces behind uh, Protect. She's the CEO and she will explain some key elements of Protect's bill and the three key areas of the campaign. She will talk about some new research with YouGov that the charity has just carried out. Liz Gardner. Thank you very much, Muktia, and thank you to Garden Court for kindly hosting today. Um, and as you said, this morning I want to set out why we at Protect believe that whistleblowing needs to be supported not just by good practice, but actually by good legislation too. And today we're surrounded by the most tragic and catastrophic example of the failure to listen to a whistleblower. Our world might be very different if someone had listened to Dr. Li Wenliang when he said he was concerned about the emergence of a new virus in Wuhan. But we don't need to look at such an extreme case to understand that whistleblowers can make a difference in every walk of life. Speaking up can stop harm, and we need to encourage and support speaking up in the public interest. Sadly, our current legislation is just not sufficient to ensure good practice. And I can give you an example from our recent research um, of our callers who are raising COVID-related concerns. 41% of them said that they felt they'd been ignored by their employer, even when they were raising public health and safety concerns in a pandemic. And shockingly, 20% of those whistleblowers went on to be dismissed. The consequences of ignoring whistleblowers can be bleak. An office worker called our advice line with a concern that their office wasn't COVID safe and that a risk assessment hadn't been carried out. She'd raised it with her employer, but they told her to stop making trouble and so she went in. She caught COVID, four of her co-workers caught COVID, and she was seriously ill and hospitalized. But it's not an isolated case. Our advice line handles over three and a half thousand whistleblowing cases a year. And last year we handled more than ever in our history. And since we've been established in 1993, we've supported more than 45,000 whistleblowers and worked with hundreds of organizations to improve their whistleblowing arrangements. And that think, I think that gives us at Protect a unique insight into what's working and what needs to change. And we do need to change because the Public Interest Disclosure Act is now nearly 25 years old. And what was world leading legislation then uh, needs reform now. At the time Peter was introduced, an understanding of legal rights for whistleblowing was in its infancy. In fact, the UK was only the second uh, country in the world to introduce such rights. And the act has proved its worth it's proved a model of providing protections for those raising concerns to an employer, to a regulator, or to a wider group. And it's been copied around the world, including in the most recent EU directive. It's driven real change, but there are now real gaps that need to be addressed if we want to ensure that good whistleblowing practices are not just restricted to the best employers or the regulated industries. So at Protect, we want to see three significant changes. Our campaign, Let's Fix UK Whistleblowing Law, aims to extend the range of people affected, to improve access to justice, and to shift balance from the remedy for workers to a duty on employers. So I'll talk about each of those in turn. First of all, the scope of protection. The current law doesn't reflect the modern workforce. As we know, the emergence of the gig economy, the growth of internships, work placements, more self-employed contractors, is proof challenging for the whole world of employment rights. But many people calling our advice line, from charity volunteers to non-executive directors, have no whistleblowing protection. In our view, it's simple. If you're in the workplace and you have a concern, we want you to raise it. And if you're then treated badly as a result, you should have a remedy. So the first call of our new campaign is to extend whistleblowing protection to all those in the workplace who need it. And we shouldn't have to leave it to District Judge Gillam to spend seven years fighting a legal claim for judges to be granted whistleblowing rights. And Chris Day, who's going to be speaking shortly, shouldn't have to fight for his whistleblowing rights to raise concerns as a junior doctor. So the law is currently full of loopholes and we need to change this. We can't just keep placing the burden on brave individuals to update the law by bringing legal challenges. 
So we think a much wider group of people should be protected, including those mistakenly thought of as whistleblowers and including job applicants. Because if a future employer says to you, well, I've seen on the tri tribunal case register that you've brought a, tri a whistleblowing case, you're obviously a troublemaker, no thanks. At the moment, you've got no remedy. And that's a form of discrimination that deters whistleblowers from bringing claims and tips the balance in favour of employers. Our second key ask is to improve access to justice. I don't think you can judge the success of the Public Interest Disclosure Act by tribunal statistics. But if you judge the success of the tribunal by the experience of its users, and I think you, perhaps you should, then I think it's failing whistleblowers. The hurdles for whistleblowers are just too high. It's a complex piece of law and it's very difficult to navigate on your own. Yet too many whistleblowers are unable to afford legal representation and they have no access to legal aid. There is a powerful remedy in interim relief. A whistleblower who's sacked can effectively ask their contract to continue till full hearing, but only if they know that right exists and only if they know they can bring a claim within seven days. So we make a number of proposals in our draft bill to extend time limits, to provide greater financial support and to simplify the law. And we're also proposing to give greater power to tribunal judges so that they can make recommendations and so employers have to take remedial action if they're found to have treated whistleblowers badly. For whistleblowers fearful of losing their jobs, it's just not enough to reassure them that they have got a remedy after the event, maybe in 12 to 18 months. So we also want to see a positive duty on employers to prevent victimization, carrying out a risk assessment, because actually prevention is much better than cure, which brings me to my third key ask. We want to see a shift in the law away from providing just an after event remedy and towards positive duties on employers. It seems to us that the last 20 years have been very much focused on encouraging people to speak up. And there's no doubt that one of the Act's successes has been encouraging good workplaces to introduce policies and effective arrangements to give their workers confidence to speak up. And at Protect, we provide training, consultancy, benchmarking to help employers develop best practice whistleblowing arrangements. And we've seen a sea change in those 20 years in how seriously the good employers take this. But let me be clear, too many workplaces, often beyond the heavily work regulated sectors, have no standards at all. And we saw how difficult this was when workers came to us to try and raise their concerns about furlough fraud. It's a huge public interest issue. Um, HMRC have estimated that three and a half billion pounds may have been claimed in error or fraud. And it was the fastest growing issue our advice line had ever dealt with because workers were being put on furlough leave and asked to return to the office as volunteers. Others were told just to carry on as usual while the employer claimed government money. And one even told us that they didn't even know they were on furlough until they saw their pay pack. And many of these people had absolutely no way to raise their concerns with their employer, no channels to whistleblow at all. And as a result, they went straight to the regulator or worse, they kept silent because without effective arrangements, people just won't speak up to their employer. And time after time, public inquiries have shown us that when things are going wrong, someone inside the organisation knew, but they were too afraid to speak up, or they spoke up to the wrong person, or they spoke up and they were ignored. Without a channel to raise concerns, serious issues can be missed. Lives and livelihoods can be lost as a result. So we think there should be a general duty on employers, and our bill suggests it should be those employers with 50 or more staff to put arrangements in place. And we don't think this is burdensome regulation. We think it's in everyone's best interest because employers should be seen by their, uh, whistleblowers should be seen by employers as assets. They're the eyes and ears of an organisation. They can be a great form of risk assessment and the best way to stop small harms before they become serious with all the reputational, financial, regulatory and public health risks that can ensue. Quite simply, whistleblowing is good for business, but too many employers aren't listening. So after 20 years of encouraging whistleblowing, we've seen some shifting cultures and much greater understanding of the importance of speaking up. But now it's time we saw more listening up too. So we want to see legislative change. Our recent research with YouGov suggests the public do too. The YouGov research we've just carried out found that three quarters of workers um, said that there should be a legal requirement on employers to, to investigate whistleblowing concerns. And introducing standards on employers means we don't just have to rely on claimants to stand up and challenge bad practice in tribunals. And of course, we're interested in those uh, standards being enforced, either by a whistleblowing commissioner or another body. 
because enforcing standards against employers could really shift the balance. So from Wuhan to Westminster, we want to encourage speaking up and we want to encourage listeners and um, employers to listen up when they do. So let's fix whistleblowing law. Let's make sure more people are protected, improve access to justice when things go wrong and put a positive duty on employers to introduce arrangements and to investigate. It's in your interest. It's in all of our interests to do so. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Gardner, thank you for that uh, pithy um, but excellent summary of the key points that Protect are driving for, for reform. And wouldn't it be wonderful um, that whistleblower, whistleblowing becomes routine and not a ma matter of great courage that is expected? Um, thank you very much. Jane Margaret Hodge has been the Labour MP for Barking since 1994. Formerly chair of the Public Accounts Committee, she served in a number of ministerial roles in the last government. She is currently chair of the all-party uh, parliamentary group on anti-corruption and responsible tax. In that role, she's been instrumental in drawing attention to the plight of UK whistleblower Jonathan Taylor, who blew the whistle on international bribery and corruption in the oil industry and is currently stranded in Croatia fighting extradition to Monaco. She brings a wide ranging perspective on the importance of whistleblowing for society. Uh, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dame Margaret. Thank you very much, Muktia. Um, I'm uh, stop me if I go on too long. I'm really pleased to be, take part in this webinar today and uh, congratulations uh, to both you at Garden Court and you at Protect for uh, facilitating this occasion. Um, I'm gonna talk about my experience as a parliamentarian with whistleblowing. And really it was when I became chair of the Public Accounts Committee in 2010, that I really began to understand the importance of whist whistleblowing in the work that we were doing, which was trying to ensure that there was value for money for the taxpayers pound. And I know there are a lot of doctors and people from the uh, health service here today. I'm actually gonna talk about another area where uh, whistleblowers played a key, key role. I've always had a huge respect. It's, you have to be really, really brave and resilient resilient to be a whistleblower. Uh, and I've had a huge respect for the many that I've met uh, down the years. Um, I'm going to talk about our tax justice work, because we only really got involved in uh, pursuing tax avoidance, tax evasion, and then going beyond that into financial crime, money laundering and fraud uh, on the back of evidence we got from whistleblowers. And I'll tell you the story. So it started that um, we we interview all the time, every regularly, HMRC about how effective and efficient they are in uh, delivering, um, uh, in, in collecting money for our, uh, that is then used in public expenditure, health service and everything. And I, we had this one session and I got the papers on a Sunday night. They were huge and they were incredibly boring. So on the Monday when we had the session, I actually turned to a bit I'd read in, in Private Eye about there having been a sweetheart deal between HMRC and the tax uh, authorities. And we questioned the head of tax on that. And he, first of all, hid behind the uh, confidentiality of taxpayers' interest. You're not allowed to talk about an individual taxpayer. And he also denied that he had been in any way involved in uh, uh, any sweetheart deal between Goldman Sachs and the HMRC. It was a very boring session. I thought I'd got no way where, and I, at the end of it, I felt a bit deflated. And then I got a big brown envelope from a whistleblower, a very brave lawyer in HMRC. And in that envelope was one sheet of paper uh, which were the minutes of a meeting that he held after a deal had been struck with uh, Goldman Sachs, in which he revealed, in which, and the minutes said that the head of law in HMRC uh, thought that the deal was unconscionable, so there had been a sweetheart deal, and that the head of tax had shaken hands on the deal, and therefore um, uh, he had uh, misled the select committee. We called everybody back. They carried on denying. We had a bit of drama by making them try and give evidence on oath. 
but that didn't work. But at the end of it all, at the end of it all, the head of tax had to leave his office. They changed their procedures in, in HMRC so that they uh, so that uh, we could have that there would be less of an opportunity to have a sweetheart deal. All on the back of the whistleblower. But the reason I tell you this story is that I was really concerned about the whistleblower. I never met him because I thought that would undermine the work that we were doing. But every time the, the con subsequent heads of tax came before our committee, I said, are you looking after him? Are you looking after him? Is he all right? And he wasn't. In the end, he could no longer tolerate being in his workplace. And he left and he retrained. Um, uh, uh, and actually, ironically, has now just found a job in a tax justice um, uh, campaign group, a, a civil society campaign group. But it's a terrible story that despite all my best efforts, I could not protect this man who uh, really worked hard to, to, to support us. And the stories go on. We had a great, with great whistleblowers who told us about HSBC's activities in Switzerland, in the Swiss bank of the HSBC branch, where they, where they were facilitating actually breaking the law, tax evasion. The only response of HSBC to that was not to try and put right the wrongs that were going on in that branch, but to go after the whistleblower and try and pursue him and get him imprisoned. Prisoned. Price Waterhouse Cooper. Similarly, we had a great uh, whistleblower from Price Waterhouse Coopers who showed how there was uh, Price Waterhouse was actually involved in the industrial marketing of a tax avoidance scheme in their Luxembourg office. And that we exposed at our committee. The only thing that PwC did was to go after the whistleblower and try and get him convicted and jailed. So there's, you know, I have a lot, and, 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 and as Elizabeth talked, I've recently been involved with Protect on this terrible case of Jonathan Taylor, who was a very, very brave whistleblower and who blew the whistle on SBM and the uh, offshore and the way in which they were uh, bribing to get contracts in very, very poor countries. And the response, is only, uh, the response of the UK government has been abysmal in that case, in their refusal to help us protect the whistleblower who is currently stranded in, um, in Croatia. So I've given you some examples of where it goes wrong. Um, uh, I, I think, and I'm sure Kevin, as the other parliamentarian, we want to do all we can to protect whistleblowers because they play a key role in our society. In my own personal view, from the experience I've had, I think part of it is in changing the law, and I'm glad that you're doing that, but there is a far wider problem. Once you've blown the whistle in the organization in which you work, getting yourself accepted you know, supported by the management and accepted by the team is really, really hard. Uh, and I think we have to work much harder on the cultural changes to make whistleblowing seen as the absolutely key uh, th uh, element in, in probity, honesty, good practice, and all those things that we want, particularly in the delivery uh, of, uh, of our public uh, services. And I leave you just with this thought. We ran a session in the Public Accounts Committee because whistleblowing was so important. We thought we'd run a session just on whistleblowing. And I'd had literally tens of whistle, and lots and lots and lots of whistleblowers who'd come to me. Google was another example where we only could expose Google because of the activities of whistleblowing. But when I tried to get any of those whistleblowers to come and give evidence to us in our committee about their experiences and about the sort of reforms that they thought would work, it was well nigh impossible. They, they, they actually just drifted away. We had about eight to start with. In the end, we had one very brave individual from the NHS who did give us evidence. But that reflected to me how tough it is for brave, resilient whistleblowers to actually do the job that we want to ensure that particularly in the public sector, but also in the private sector, people act honestly. Uh, and ensure that they uh, act in the interests of all of us uh, to uh, deliver the goods, the services, or whatever it is that they are responsible for. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Margaret. Um, it's uh, it, it, quite upsetting to hear that even from your position, giving all those reassurances, 
um, and doing your best for uh, a whistleblower not to be suffering detriment that nevertheless um, he suffered detriment. Um, although it's good to know that he found uh, alternative employment. Um, just uh, following on, if I may, just from uh, some of those uh, very interesting examples that you gave us, you'll note the Protect Bill is primarily looking at the uh, employment law. Uh, uh, it's, pri it's primarily considering employment law, and yet uh, whistleblowing and threats of legal action often come outside of this space. Um, ha have you any ideas how, as to how we can deal with that problem? Say that again. Uh, uh, how do we deal with the problem of uh, whistleblowers outside of em employment suffering uh, detriment? Uh, because the bill itself is really pretty, pretty, much, pretty much focused on employment legislation, uh, it falls within employment legislation. Uh, outside of the employment sphere, there is, there is um, nothing there. Um, I couldn't agree. I mean, I think this is really difficult. And, you know, I would hope that Protect would put it somewhere. If I knew the answer, I can tell you, I would have uh, 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 pursued it down the years because I've seen too many really, really brave whistleblowers suffer. Um, what can you do, you know, in a, in, in a team if people turn their backs on that person? What can you actually do? Um, how can you in that work situation, even with the best of, le this is why I think I said to Elizabeth before I came, agreed to uh, come this morning, legislation is very important. It gives us a basis from which to move forward. It's sort of necessary, but not sufficient. And changing the culture so that we, you know, that within the workplace, whistleblowers are respected. I mean, I'll give you another case. There was a whistleblower, a Circo whistleblower, where uh, uh, who 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 blew the whistle on a on a contract that Circo ran in Cornwall, uh, and um, to say that they were fiddling the figures really on how whether or not they were meeting the terms of the contract. The only response of Circo was to rifle the lockers of everybody who worked in this in this area to find out who on earth was the whistleblower. How do you change that culture? I mean, not everybody wants to. I know with the best respect, we're, we're in a legal position today. Not everybody wants to necessarily pursue it through that very long, expensive and painful way of using the law. So it's a cultural change. So all I can say is you use the law as a basis for moving forward, but then pursuing that cultural change, I think probably requires education, it requires promotion of good practice, it requires uh, exposing those who don't follow practice. It's all those sort of levers that you try and lose, but it is a huge challenge, Mukti, and I wish I had the answer. Thank, thank, thank you so much, uh, Dame Margaret. Um, I turn now to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Chris Days practicing doctor who has a junior doctor in the NHS raised concerns about understaffing and patient safety and found himself in an extremely lengthy court battle to assert his whistleblowing rights. He brought a successful case in the Court of Appeal that essentially changed the law and granted junior doctors rights. Some aspects of litigation are still ongoing which shows how whistleblowing can have life-changing effects. Chris is going to talk about the importance of extending the scope of whistleblowing uh, protection and access to justice. It's my uh, great privilege and honour to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Day. Thank you, Mukhtar. Um, so why should we fix whistleblowing law? Um, I think my case provides good illustrations of the various problems that occur when the public interest, dis the well, the well-intentioned public interest disclosure act plays out in the employment tribunals of this country. Um, so my, my case is a response to serious patient safety concerns I raised back all the way back in 2014 as an intensive care unit doctor. I say these concerns are very serious and very verifiable and are linked to two deaths. And I, I also say it's very easy to check what I'm saying is correct. Um, so that's my case is basically the response to that act of what I now know to be whistleblowing. Now to really understand 
where this current legislation goes wrong, follow the money in my case. So let's start with what the taxpayer spent on it. Now that is somewhere between 700,000 pounds and then a million pounds. Um, and then my side of the litigation um, through crowdfunding has spent 390 um, thousand pounds. Now that's nearly a million pounds to lawyers. Now let's see what we all got for our money from the legal profession. Um, so we didn't get a final judgment on the facts. We got damage to whistleblowing law um, in respect to all doctors below consultant grade in the country and large numbers of agency um, workers. The public got a forced public statement induced by cost threats that were later denied to the press and to MPs that basically said that I agreed the NHS acted in good faith. Now, you can probably sense from what I'm saying that I don't really believe that. So that's another outrageous thing that the public interest disclosure has facilitated. And I think the public deserve better than that from legislation that on its face is there to promote and protect people that say important things in the public interest, where it appears to not do that. And I'm not saying that it wasn't meant to do that and protect formerly public concern at work were um, trailblazers in the way that they put it onto the statute books. But there needs to be, which there is, from the great work that Protect are doing at the moment, an acceptance that the way the Public Interest Disclosure Act plays out is not in the public interest <coughs> and often wastes huge amounts of money. And if you take my case as an example, even if you did want to cover up everything that I said, about an intensive care unit in South East London. There's got to be cheaper ways to do it. And, I, and even from an economic point of view, that means the law needs to change. But we all know that when an intensive care unit doctor raises something important, it might be in everyone's interest to listen to what they say and maybe act on it, rather than spend a million pounds attacking the individual, discrediting what I say are verifiable concerns, and then a astonishingly um, undermining the law for all other doctors in the country. So I, I just wanted to focus on three of the tactics that have been used against me that I think come basically from the legislation, the current legislation, um, and they are seen as viable options for um, employers. And that, so the first bit of the tactics against me was to attack the reasonableness of what I was saying about safety issues. It has now taken me six years to get my opponents to accept that my reasonable belief in cover-up and safety was reasonable. And that, that's astonishing in itself that £700,000 has been used to make what a doctor says about something as important as intensive care seem unreasonable. Um, the next thing is attacking me as a doctor and as a person. So that's more understandable if you're not a doctor, it's budslinging. But it's very, very expensive budslinging that the taxpayer funds to essentially confuse important issues about patient safety. And then the third tactic is attacking my employment status. We, with the assistance of a Telegraph journalist, have established that actually all that taxpayer money was used to mislead a court on the reality of how 54,000 doctors are employed in practice. Withheld from disclosure was a contract that showed exactly how these 54,000 doctors were employed. And then hundreds of thousands of pounds was spent arguing the opposite to what is plainly written in this contract and making it into an academic legal debate, which we essentially won in the Court of Appeal with the assistance of Protect, which is good in some ways, but I, we've since found out that the situation was rather more simple and it was simply a contract hidden from disclosure. And that makes people far more uncomfortable because I think it suits the establishment to, to play, to represent what happened to us in the Court of Appeal as us winning an academic legal debate. But actually what, what we could have done is just disclose this contract back in 2014 and then I would have had my case heard back then. And 
all of this public money would have been saved. And I think that just illustrates why the law needs to change, because we can't have a million pounds being spent every time a doctor says something uncomfortable. And I, I think those examples are something that I think Protect have really tried to remedy in their proposals. And that's about coverage, making it less, making employers less able to get out of being named and having to respond to the facts of the whistleblowing case. So Protect's proposals on coverage would hopefully make it not necessary for people like me, a doctor and Judge Gillen to go through expensive litigation just to say that I have a right to be listened to and not be harmed saying something in the public interest. The other thing that I think is crucial in Protect's proposals are a new statutory body. Now I would say that the rules are there, they're just not being followed. And not only that, there's this confidence in employers and in particular the public sector that they will never have to account for anything. They will play these legal games and more often than not will win and the facts will never ever need to be responded to. Now I think the proposal of a statutory body to actually enforce and regulate, even if they enforced and regulated the rules we already have, um, that would make a huge difference. And I would say that is what I'm most excited about in this new legislation. Um, the fact that um, someone for once might have to follow a rule that's set out. Um, so that's why I, the lawmakers among us, I think, A, something needs to be done, even if just for money. You can't, you can't have a million pounds being spent on crushing doctors. It's a waste of money. Um, and a new statutory body to um, enforce the rules we already have, or maybe new rules that uh, set out and protect proposal. I have overrun, so I better stop it there. Thank, thank you uh, very much, uh, Chris. Uh, I think we're developing a, a common theme uh, echoing the need for a change of cultures that Dame, Dame Margaret mentioned, um, that uh, employers should investigate rather than attack or conceal. Uh, I don't know, um, Chris, whether if, if there was a duty on uh, the trust to investigate your concerns, uh, do, do you think things would pan out? Would have panned out differently? Well, there, there are actually. I mean, my view is there's. We're not, we're not short of duties. I'm a regulated individual, and the people that deal with me are regulated individuals. We can kid ourselves if we think that it's a lack of duty. It's it, it it's it's misconduct and people not being honest. And and I think that's what Dame Margaret um, is saying. And I must say, hearing Dame Margaret makes me think that I've got off lightly <laughs> um, as an NHS whistleblower because I've not been put in prison and no one's trying to, well, as far as I know, no one's trying to extradite me. Um, but that's the issue is I think in all of us, it's human nature. Someone says something we don't want to hear and we want to crush them. I think it's in all of us to be a whistleblower and it's probably in all of us to crush one too. But the reason people do the crushings because I think they can get away with it um, and they're right in the UK you can you can you can quite easily get away with lying crushing a whistleblower and as you see some of the even arguing the nation's doctors out of whistleblowing protection by hiding a contract which is potentially contempt of court you can get away with and um, that's the problem and who we that's the thing we have to deal with are we prepared to deal head-on with people of power lying and committing misconduct. And now there is this culture that you can get away with it. So that's gonna be a very brave MP to change that. Um, and who wants to do that at the moment? They're not queuing up. But okay. that's how I think you're gonna solve this problem. Well, Dame Margaret had a hand up, so that's very encouraging. Yeah, but I imagine Dame Margaret will 
it would be interesting. Do you feel supported, Dave Margaret, um, in your endeavours? Um, well, you've which got I found very inspiring, to be honest. You've got Kevin. Uh, Kevin. Kevin and I work together on a lot of these tax justice um, issues. Um, do I feel? I mean, I don't want to get partisan on this, but I, th I think there is a. We're not I allowed. <laughs> I don't want to get part, but it's very difficult when uh, your prime minister and leader doesn't have a great respect for the laws either. And I'm not saying that, Kevin, I promise you in a partisan way. I'm saying that in a, in a person who just really cares about democracy way. Um, but I think this issue about uh, uh, the, the, the way the threat to our democracy from corruption for me, has gone beyond the financial service sector, which is where I focused a lot of my energy in the last 10 years, to other parts of our society. And it's really, really dangerous. We pretend that we hold our heads up high and that we're a you know, very well-developed democracy. We believe in the rule of law and all that stuff. And you look at how gradually all those pillars of democracy are being undermined, whether it's parliament, whether it's the press, whether it's the courts, uh, the judiciary, whether it's the rule of law, uh, whether it's the civil service. Uh, and we are, I think, on a cusp of um, losing our moral integrity, I'm afraid. But I'm going to fight it. And I'm, and I'm sure Ken will be with me in lots of that. <laughs> well, I think that I should not hesitate any further in bringing in our final panellist, um, Kevin Holling, Hollingrake, uh, Conservative MP for Thirsk and Morton since 2015. 15. Kevin has a long-standing interest in whistleblowing and is a vice chair of the all-party parliamentary group on whistleblowing. He too has a strong, been a strong supporter of Jonathan Taylor and he takes a particular interest in the role of regulators. Kevin is going to speak about the importance of standards and enforcement. Uh, over to you please Kevin. Yeah thanks Mukti and thanks for inviting me and um, very much like um, Margaret, I, I think there is a lot of momentum behind the changes we need now. And it's great to see Protect bringing forward um, this draft bill. But um, yes, as, as well as being the vice chair of the All-Party Group on uh, whistleblowing, I'm also the chair, a co-chair of the All-Party Group on Fair Business Banking. And I can tell you the immense contribution that whistleblowers ha have made towards the fighting of fraud, the righting of wrongs. And yet, and I can list some of the people, incredibly quite a few of them in my constituency, but um, invariably, every single one of them has been really badly treated, terribly badly treated. It, and, and it's just unacceptable. And I think we are paying lip service to whistleblowing in this country at the moment. And that's not just employers, it's also regulators. And I'm very pleased to see within the draft bill some responsibilities for regulators because it's, it's so much needed. Um, I, uh, prior to being in Parliament in 2015, I, was, I had my own business, which we grew from a small business into a large business, and they're uh, listed on AIM and employing about a thousand people. And um, you know, as your business grows, you lose touch with what's happening at the sharp end. And so, I, but I, as the chief executive of that company, prior to becoming a member of Parliament, I dealt with all the complaints, and I wanted to deal with the complaints because, as Elizabeth said earlier. The, these, these, your, your complaints are your eyes and your ears. They, your complainants, your customers are your eyes and your ears. And I do question whether this should be just around employment law because there are lots of instances I have got where this is the, the whistleblower has not been an employee or any kind of worker within an enterprise. So I, I do think we need this to be a good debate about the extent of whistleblower legislation reform. Um, I mean, the FCA. I, which is the regulator I come into contact most, do not have a good record in terms of how they treat whistleblowers. There's no question about it. And which is surprising because a regulator can all, only ever be a watchdog. It cannot be a bloodhound. It's just not practicable to be able to look into all the nooks and crannies of, of the businesses that are organisations they're regulating. Um, so they should be welcoming, welcoming with open arms individuals who bring cases to them of wrongdoing. And that's not been the case. Um, not just not just the FCA, but I mean, my whistleblowers in my constituency, Ian Foxley, who blew the whistle of GPT, who accepted who, who accepted a guilty entered a guilty plea yesterday on a on bribery charges. Paul Moore, who was uh, my constituent, who first flagged up some of the uh, financial irregularities, you might say, at HBOS Reading, uh, and we know where that ended up. But also people like Paul Carlier, Joanne Russo, 
But the worst one was Sally Masterton, who was employed at Lloyd's, of course, and um, she produced a report on what was going on at Lloyd's, and she was she was constructively dismissed. She was um, discredited for five years. Um, Lloyd's wrote to the regulator to say there's nothing to see here. The regular didn't invest. Regulator didn't investigate the FCA. Um, I asked Andrew Bailey when he was head of the FCA four, on four occasions, did he follow his own whistleblower procedures when he dealt with Sally Masterton? Because eventually they apologised to her and compensated her five years later in 2018. And I still haven't had an answer to that question. And as a parliamentarian even, <laughs> no, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we actually established the FCA in, in statute, of course, I am not a, a relevant person when it comes to the current legislation. So I didn't, I, he didn't have to answer that question. And, and it was a simple question. Did you follow your own procedures? So we're just not nowhere near where we need to be. And of course, the other thing that Margaret and I deal with a lot, of course, is all kinds of fraud, tax fraud, but all, many other kinds of fraud. And the UK has a very, very bad record of prosecuting fraud, of course. Another, another collapse and another trial this week with Serco and the SFO. And what the, what, um, the SFO need is a failure to pre prevent legislation, which Margaret and I are fully behind. So organisations are responsible to put measures in place to prevent fraud happening or, and economic crime. But also alongside that, the, number one, the other thing we need is whistleblower reform and particularly a commission, an office for a whistleblower, whatever you want to call it, a body that will hold employers' feet to the fire and regulators' feet to the fire to do the right thing and make sure whistleblowers are properly protected, of course, but also that their concerns are properly investigated. And there is nobody doing that right now, which means gives the employers and regulators the wriggle room not to, to cover things up, as Chris was saying before, incredibly, um, when actually they should be looking at this and, and, it's, and, and properly investigating these complaints. And I would say as well, of course, without exception, every whistleblower I've dealt with has been financially, has put in, put in a financially catastrophic situation. So these people need properly compensated. I know this is the most controversial part of it, but um, it's no good just paying what they would have had in, in terms of an employment contract. This can affect their life chances, their whistleblower's life chances. So people have to be properly compensated as well as protected, as well as their concerns investigated. Um, otherwise, whistleblowers simply won't come forward. And as we all know, whistleblowers are not coming forward today because of that, because they see how badly treated other people are. So um, really very much welcome the debate and uh, we need to get this legislation absolutely right. We've got a chance to learn from best practice right around the world, but Margaret and I committed to bringing this forward. The business secretary answered a question to me yesterday, said he was committed to bringing forward reform. So really very much hope that this will lead to constructive uh, moves to reform the legislation on whistleblowing and uh, and lots more whistleblowers coming forward and properly protected. Thank, thank you very much, Kevin. I think it's pretty damning that you say that we're nowhere near where we need to be, but I think some of us will be encouraged by uh, certainly the enthusiasm that you and Dame Margaret are showing. Um, perhaps I could uh, ask you, Kevin, as we turn to the question and answers, I'm going to pick up a question that's come from one of our attendees. Uh, and um, perhaps you could start with you, Kevin. Um, and the question is this. Um, may I ask you what you think is the likelihood of the present government supporting these amendments and whether the better angle to pursue is from an employment or regulatory law perspective? Um, well, in terms of uh, the business secretary, as the business secretary answered my question yesterday, that he wants to see reform in this area, so which is very encouraging. So, and I'm sure you look at the um, the detail of your um, proposed legislation, but also, as Elizabeth said earlier, there's two other private members' bills which were fairly well uh, developed and fairly well developed proposals within them. And I, I personally think it would be good to get everybody in the same place rather than have different. Um, uh, different, uh, uh, different wish lists from different bodies in terms of how we take this forward. So Philippa Whitford, of course, and um, and I think it was Mary Robinson. Uh, and, sorry, it was, it was uh, from the laws. I can't remember the name of the peer, I'm afraid. Um, Margaret probably know. But um, the more we're on the same page, 
the more then I think we can get the business secretary to make sure the legislation is fit for purpose. As I said before, I don't think this should be solely about employment law um, because there are other instances that are not around employment law. When the and H. Boss Reading scandal, for example, that the, the fraud there was being highlighted by uh, individuals who have been mistreated by, by HBOS at the time, back in 2006, 2007. And um, I know it would be slightly different, but if you had a regulator at that point, uh, Office for the Whistleblower, or Commit Whistleblower Commission, I think, as you put in your draft legislation, just making sure those claims were properly investigated, then this would have come to light so much more quickly and it would have uh, saved a decade of mistreatment of, of many people within that scandal. So I would like to see, see the debate around a, a wider context to the legislation that we need. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Dame Margaret, could I ask you to respond in terms of support for the uh, proposed changes? Yeah, I'm, I think they're perfectly sensible changes. If I'm, if I'm honest with you, I think there are some... You know, it may well be, uh, and I look at Kevin, who's sort of on the whistle, you know, on the APPG for whistleblowing, which I'm not, but uh, it may be uh, that we could take, I thought the first and the third had a greater likelihood of uh, uh, moving us forward. Oh, there's my um, my next appointment come. The first and the third had a greater likelihood of moving us forward um, than the middle one, which is about legal, you're not going to get legal aid. I mean, you know this, Mukti, that the legal aid budget has been so annihilated and slashed that the idea that this will be given priority within it, I think is probably less likely. But I think if we looked at amendments to, uh, to, the, to the employment bill that's coming forward, we might, you might tell us which are the most important. And the ombudsman point, I think is quite, a, that has come up a lot in the chat. I think that's really important. I'm afraid I've got to go because my next appointment has come, but can I just thank you for a really, really, really stimulating session really, really great. And I'm sure Kevin and I will work together and try and see what we can do with Protect and others. Thanks. Thank, Bye. You, Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah, I'm rushing. Sorry, I'm rushing. Bye. All right. Thanks, Margaret. So we still have, do have some time and a number of you have been putting questions into the Q&A box So please continue to do so. Um, I'm going to turn to a question for Chris. Um, thank you, Dr. Chris Day, for sharing your experience and perspectives. What do you think about the speaking up scheme in the NHS? Did you use it? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't think it was there when I, back in 2014. Um, I, I think the speak up, well, I mean, the speak up guardian service has been scared to get anywhere near my case. Um, I've found them to be no help at all, even on something as basic as arguing the nation's doctors out of whistleblowing protection. They seem scared of their own shadow, you know, when they couldn't, they couldn't even give a clear position on whether it was right to sort of distort the reality of the way doctors are employed to, to undermine whistleblowing law. And they were very nice, but they just wouldn't, wouldn't comment on anything like that. And I think if they can't even do that, um, it's it kind of Ill illustrative of the actual problem here. And it's not that in the NHS that people don't feel able to say something. I don't think. I think, you know, doctors are saying things all of the time. And if you look at what I actually said, it was an operational conversation over the phone. I mean, that's what most people wouldn't regard that as whistleblowing protection. It would, they would regard that as an ICU doctor making a phone call about something really dangerous that needs to be sorted. Um, the actual issue is all this misconduct, dishonesty and cover-up. And I can tell you, the, the whistleblowing guardians scheme don't want to go anywhere near that. And I think they're almost in denial. And they want to change culture. They will keep on saying that they want to change culture, but no one wants to deal with the culture that is here at the moment. Um, and they almost switch off when you put to them, well, okay, we don't, we don't live in the perfect world at the moment. I know you want the perfect world. It's wonderful that you do. But what are we are going to do about the world that we live in at the moment? And, and they don't have an answer to that. Um, and that's why a lot of these whistleblowers, 
you know, would speak in stronger terms about the Guardian's office. I think I've been nice about them in, you know, when you compare what other whistleblowers say about them. And that is a problem because at the moment, it's our only hope. And if you write to an MP about whistleblowing in the NHS, all you'll get is what a wonderful thing the Guardian system is. And there's a disconnect um, from anyone who's ever raised an issue in the NHS and has got some outcome as a result of it, think they're a waste of space, the Guardian um, office. And it's, I've been very, very patient with them. It's taken me six years. I think this is the first time in six years I've publicly criticised them. Um, so, and it feels, I feel very comfortable doing it because I've waited six years. Um, because I, I think it's important that something's done about what they're prepared to do in these cases. And maybe that is, it's another argument for this statutory body, I think, that Protect are proposing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Um, the next question is for uh, Kevin. Is there a danger that a super, super whistleblowing regulator may undermine the role of other regulators? Um, no, I don't think so. As long as their role is tightly defined, I think that's the thing. It's not there to regulate the financial service industry, for example, the FCA do that. Um, but they're there to make sure that the FCA complies with its obligations uh, under whistleblowing legislation, and same with an employer. So it just, it's not complicated. You know, you, how a whistleblower is protected by the regulator, just making sure they're protected. I mean, the FCA, as some of you will know, actually named a regulator to one, uh, name, sorry, named a whistleblower to the company, to the uh, organization they were blowing the whistle about, uh, hugely inappropriately. So, um, putting proper protections in place, making sure that the regulators or employers follow the set, clearly set out procedures. It's not complicated stuff. Chris will tell you what he was, what, what he blew the whistle on. He just expected this to be investigated. It just needs to be a simple process that's followed. And so, no, I don't think it's duplication at all. It's simply holding employers and regulators feet to the fire for their commitments. Thank you. Um, just have a couple more questions. I note it's 10.30, but um, hopefully our panellists are, are all right to stay on for another, say, 10 minutes. Excellent. Sure. Uh, thank you. The next question is directed uh, for you, Liz. Um, and this has come from uh, a whistleblower. Um, it says that I discovered that the relevant regulators were as de deceitful as my employer in attempting to cover up a number of issues. Does Protect suggest any form of independent investigator that can hold regulators to account and support whistleblowers from all sectors of employment? Well, I think that very much picks up on the comments that Kevin was just making about, you know, if we're going to impose uh, standards on, on employers, we need somebody to enforce them. We usually rely on regulators to do that. And where the regulators uh, are not acting fairly, then perhaps we need somebody to be looking at that from the whistleblowing perspective. And, and I think generally with the regulators, what we've been doing in, in recent years is bringing them together and looking at what the kind of practice is. There's huge inconsistency across the piece. Um, you know, Chris has been talking about some of his concerns around uh, some of the NHS regulators. But on the other hand, we've also got people like the CQC who you know, with that West Suffolk case where the, where the um, hospital was uh, carrying out a witch hunt to try and find the whistleblower, you know, the CQC have intervened and um, downgraded a hospital because of the way they treated whistleblowers. So there is this huge variety and inconsistency, and I think that's what we need to tackle. Um, you know, we want all of the regulators to have very clear rules and to, and to particularly pick up on that question. You know, a lot of regulators see their role as looking at the concern, and that's really, really important. And they have no responsibility, no duty of care to the whistleblower. And I think they need to do both. Um, and I think they need to, to understand that when an organisation treats a whistleblower badly, that also says something really powerful about the organisation. So it should be of interest to the regulator. Thank you. Can I come back? Can, just, could I say something in response to that? Um, just the West Suffolk is a really good example. But if you look at what the CQC actually did, 
what does downgrading a hospital mean? They, no one was held to account. They just came and took a star off their sign. Th that's not accountability for a witch hunt against medical professionals trying to raise something serious. That's unpainting a star off a sign. I think we have a long way to go before we feel comfortable in all of us uh, holding people to account. But I think we're seeing some, I think, you know, it would be wrong to say that the whole of the speak up culture in the NHS hasn't changed in the last 20 years since the mid staffs. But I think our latest research also looked at awareness. And one of the things we found was that in heavily regulated sectors, like the financial services sector and the health service, there is much greater awareness of whistleblowing rights and how to raise concerns. The question is, how do we respond to those concerns? So I think we're making the changes in terms of the culture and people being ready to speak up. I think there's a lot more um, willingness there. But, you know, we've got more to do to make sure the listening up and the response is appropriate. I agree with you there. Thank you. This is a question uh, perhaps the three of you might have some input on. And this is based upon your experiences. What do you think uh, organisations need? in terms of investigating whistleblowers' concerns. And the person asking the question has put, e.g. governance, transparency, training. Um, perhaps, Kevin, you'd like to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an organisation like Protect can play a huge role here, of course, in terms of articulating best practice and providing the tools to, to then develop good whistleblowing policies internally. But it, as we said before so many times, it's not just about policies, it's about follow through. And it's, and it's about implementation of those policies and, and taking concerns seriously. So, um, so yes, I mean, and I think alongside this, we do need a cultural shift, I think, in terms of how we perceive whistleblowers. I think all the whistleblowers I've worked with have felt they were treated as if they were just troublemakers. And I think somebody said in the chat, I think, you know, is a whistleblower the right term? Is it quite a divisive term? Is it? But um, I think we need employers and regulators uh, and uh, public bodies all to recognise the very important work that um, that is done by whistleblowers and what risk they take. And so that, that concerns when they're raised are embraced rather than tried to be minimized or swept under a carpet uh, um, and those people marginalized. So, uh, so yes, best practice by all means. And the more we have a common view of that, from people like Protect and others using their expertise, the better. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Well, building on what Kevin has said about the regulators, I think that rather than proper investigations into the substance of these protected disclosures in these cases, they just shifted on to the employment tribunal to do that process. And they're not specialist tribunals. Um, in the finance sector and the health sector, nowhere is on an employment tribunal a finance person or a, or a doctor that can make sense of what has gone on. And with a whistleblower acting in good faith, I mean, I, I'm not talking about vexatious whistleblowers, but or people, but just a whistleblower that's acting in good faith. There's a spectrum. There's some somebody who legitimately believes something that might respectfully be making a fuss about nothing, and then at the other end of the spectrum, but still honestly believe it. Do not need, do not deserve to have their life and their career destroyed for it. And then at the other end of the spectrum is somebody saying something objectively serious with loads of serious evidence to back them up. And I don't think in the NHS there's any attempt to find out where a person is in that spectrum when they make a protected disclosure. And worst of all, in the employment tribunal, absolutely no attempt whatsoever. If anything, it's, it's, it's obstructed that process. Um, and that's what's key, not just for the public interest. Obviously, you want an investigation into the substance of the disclosure because everyone that's the only way everyone will benefit from it. But from a justice point of view, it is relevant because if you have a whistleblower that has raised something very serious with serious evidence, or you have someone that maybe has legitimately feels something that a lot of other people wouldn't agree with, you need to know what you're dealing with when you're dealing with these cases. And there's no attempt by anyone to find out. Um, and I think that fails not only the justice process for the whistleblower, obviously, um, fails the public interest. Um, 
And that, that is the problem with these investigations, I think, or there is not, no investigation. Thank you, Chris. And finally to you, Liz, uh, this will be the last uh, answer to a question. Okay, well, I mean, I would absolutely endorse uh, what both the previous speakers have said, you know, putting policies and, and arrangements in place is just the start of, of, of your journey to, to introduce a positive speak up culture. And that's why we at Protect have developed a benchmark so that you, you know, it's important that organisations don't just put in place some arrangement and carry out the investigation. You have to be doing that regular review, audit, making sure that they're working. And to pick up on Chris's point, one way that you can test if it's working is you ask the whistleblower, what was their experience of going through this? Um, and what has the organisation learnt from the whistleblower that's raised this concern? Um, and that's what our benchmark tries to do. It tries to look at all those different areas that you need to cover to get to best practice. It's about, yes, of course, it's about governance. It's about training everybody including the manager who's going to be the first recipient of the concern, because that's that first interaction is really important. But this audit and review of your processes, the constantly looking and seeing what are we learnt and what is the experience of whistleblowers and are we having reports of people being treated badly when they've tried to do the right thing? You know, I think that's incredibly crucial. So um, I think there's a huge um, there's a huge amount of good practice that is going on out there. And we're really, really happy to talk to any employers who would like to work with us on developing that. Excellent, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to conclude there. Uh, apologies that we've run a little bit over time and thank you very much to, the, to our panelists uh, for sharing their experiences, knowledge and uh, enthusiasm. Um, I look forward to the campaign developing and I hope it will involve a wide range of those affected in society. Um, just for the last word, I'm gonna hand over to Protect CEO Liz. Um, particularly how people can join the campaign. Absolutely. And thank you very much indeed to all our panellists and to you, Dimuktia, for, for chairing this so well. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to all your many wonderful questions uh, in the, in the Q&A. Um, we are going to be continuing this campaign. Oh, it's great to hear that Colin, that, sorry, that Kevin and, and Margaret are, are happy to champion this uh, in Parliament. And we're going to be approaching backbench MPs to put their name in the ballot to, uh, to take forward a bill uh, this session. We'll be working on the employment bill uh, with amendments as well. Um, but I think anybody that wants to join the campaign, sign up to our newsletter, have a look at our web pages, write to your MP if you can, and tell them what needs to change. Um, and thank you very much for a really interesting debate this morning. And thank you to our audience for your wonderful questions.